Have you ever seen one of those old cartoons where there's a train flying along at top speed and all of a sudden they pull down a metal lever and sparks shoot out everywhere and the train slows down? What's happening there? Well, the kinetic energy of the train is being converted into heat, into what we call thermal energy. The same transition that that train made, we're about to make. We were talking about things like kinetic energy, potential energy, work, and now we're going to focus in on thermal energy. It turns out that thermal energy is measured by temperature. And we're going to take a close look at this concept. Along the way, we'll understand things like the laws of thermodynamics and learn how to understand the world around us in terms of thermal energy. Let's learn. Let's begin by reviewing our lesson objectives. What are we going to get done in this lesson? First, we'll introduce thermal energy. Then we'll learn about energy transfer. And lastly, we'll introduce the laws of thermodynamics. This metal is literally lava hot, just below 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. But why is it glowing? Well, it's complicated, but part of the reason is because the high temperature means all the iron atoms are moving around really fast. And when things move fast, they glow. At this temperature, iron, which is normally a solid, flows easily as a liquid. Give iron enough energy and even metal will become a liquid. This makes it easy to purify and work with. Eventually, we can pour it into molds and let it cool. As it cools, it becomes a solid. The atoms within the solid block are now moving much slower as they begin to cool, and they glow just a bit less brightly. The hot iron pours its warmth into the surroundings, making iron smelting a very hot job. Clearly, there is energy here. But what sort of energy? Well, it's thermal energy, which is the energy responsible for temperature. Let's compare two samples, one at high temperature and one at low temperature. In the blue, we have a bunch of atoms that are relatively cool. And in the red, a bunch of atoms that are relatively hot. You'll notice that the red atoms are farther apart. And that turns out to be one thing that happens as we increase temperature. Higher thermal energy gives us larger volumes. They expand with increasing temperature. But that's not all that it does. Higher thermal energy also gives us faster molecules. They're shaking more. Notice around the blue atoms, we see just a single line representing one circle, and that's kind of the area over which those blue atoms are going to shake. But in the red, they shake over a much larger area. So the multiple lines shown there around the red atoms are telling you they're shaking faster. So higher thermal energy means faster molecules. And remember, because it's energy associated with motion, it's kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is energy due to motion. And what that tells you is that faster molecules are going to have a higher kinetic energy. What that means is if you take a look at a glowing red hot iron rod, that it actually has high kinetic energy, but it's at a very small scale. The atoms moving around within that iron are moving really fast. So ultimately, thermal energy is a form of kinetic energy. And we can measure this thermal energy with temperature scales. Here we have a bunch of temperature scales, which we'll go through in detail later in this unit. We have Celsius, Kelvin, Fahrenheit, and all of those are measures of thermal energy. One thing I'll highlight right now is that all of them have an absolute zero. That is a lowest possible temperature. An absolute zero is a special place. Absolute zero is where all motion stops. But remember, the take home point for now is that temperature measures thermal energy. So that's how we can measure how much thermal energy something has. It's also important to remember that thermal energy can be transferred. That is, it can go from one object to another. Take, for example, this kiln about to fire a bunch of pottery. That pottery needs to get hot so that it can have the properties that we'd like it to have when it cools back down again. And as it goes into that oven, it's going to warm because the oven's hot. We're familiar with that in everyday life. Objects in contact approach the same temperature. 
So those pots, as we put them in the kiln, will eventually glow bright red because they're hanging out in the hot oven. Eventually, they'll reach thermal equilibrium. That's when two objects in contact reach the same temperature. So these are actually going to be the same temperature as the oven around it if we give them long enough to warm inside the kiln. This means the heat is being transferred, but it raises the question, how is heat transferred? Well, there are three ways heat can be transferred. Here we have a pot of water being warmed on a flame. Let's go through these different mechanisms of heat transfer one at a time. First, conduction. Notice the handle is hot because it's directly touching the hot pot. So this is kind of the most straightforward form of heat transfer, conduction. It's when heat is transferred through direct contact. So just directly touching something that's hot. Secondly, we have convection. Notice within that pot, we have all of those arrows showing the hot stuff on the bottom moving up to the cooler stuff up top. So if you have a substance at multiple temperatures and the molecules can flow through it, then we can heat things by convection. That's just when heat is transferred by moving fluids. Okay, lastly, we have radiation. Those arrows coming out from the flames in the hot pot represent light, which we also can call radiation. You know that because the fire glows blue. And also there's infrared light you can't even see. Radiation is another way heat can be transferred. Radiation is heat transferred through light. If we continue to add energy to water, eventually it boils. And so what we learned there is that thermal energy can cause phase changes, like the transition from liquid to gas. It's actually kind of interesting though, because if we keep adding heat to this water, after it's already 100 degrees Celsius, it doesn't actually warm it up any further. Instead, it just makes the water boil faster. This is an interesting property that we'll study in more detail later in this unit. But remember for now that if we add energy to water at 100 degrees Celsius, it makes it boil. It doesn't heat it. Well, there are more phases than just liquids and gases. We have solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. And as we go from left to right, we actually get higher and higher in thermal energy. Plasma might be the phase you're least familiar with. It happens when we get something really hot, so hot that the nuclei and electrons in the material separate, which is pretty crazy. This occurs in the sun. It's also the case that as we move from left to right, we're going to experience higher temperatures. So solids occur at the lowest temperature for any given substance and plasmas at the highest temperatures. Lastly, let's review the laws of thermodynamics. These are laws that govern energy and its transformations. First up, we have the first law of thermodynamics, which says energy cannot be created or destroyed. So we can't just get free energy. We can change it from one form to another, but the amount of energy we have now is the amount of energy we'll have tomorrow. We can't make it. The second law of thermodynamics says that the disorder of the universe constantly increases. But in physics, we have a fancy word for disorder. We call it entropy. Entropy is just a measure of disorder. So with that in mind, we'll often restate the second law of thermodynamics as the entropy of the universe constantly increases. What do we mean? Well, take, for example, the Colosseum. You'll notice that it's falling apart. It's actually in really good shape for being as old as it is, but it's falling apart, and that's what ruins always do. Stuff falls apart over time, unless we work really hard to keep it running. And that's just the second law of thermodynamics in action. It's going from order, a nice structure, to disorder, a falling apart one. Lastly, we have the third law of thermodynamics. It says the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin is zero. Let's take a look at a crystal. Here we have this nice crystal, and it looks pretty beautiful. It's actually not perfect. You can kind of see the cracks and fissures in that crystal, but it's still clear that it has very nice structure. And actually, that's true at the atomic level as well. When we zoom in to a crystal, it looks like this, where the purple and the green represent atoms. And notice they're in nice, repeating structures, one after another, over and over again, in all directions. And if our crystal is perfect and has no breaks in it, and we take it, to the lowest possible temperature, zero Kelvin, that is absolute zero, as we talked about early. Then we can say that the entropy is zero. 
So the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin is zero. Let's review what we've learned. First, we introduced thermal energy, where we saw that it's the energy that can be measured by temperature, and it has to do with the motion of atoms and molecules. The faster they're moving, the higher the thermal energy. Then we learned about energy transfer, where we saw that energy can be transferred by direct contact, or by flowing fluids, or by light. Lastly, we introduced the laws of thermodynamics, where we saw that energy is conserved, disorder increases, and that perfect crystals at zero Kelvin have no entropy whatsoever. They're perfectly ordered. Hey, hey.